Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Hena, and um, I'm a senior research data officer, and I'm working at UK Data Service and based at University of Essex. And my colleague Gail is with us today as well to keep an eye on the technical side of things. So thank you very much for joining us today. Um, as you're aware that this session is about ethical and le legal guidelines or considerations in data sharing. So um, just a quick question. If you would like to share your thoughts here, um, is there any specific aspect of ethics or legal compliance that you are particularly interested in? This will help us um, to update the current content for our future sessions. So that, that would be very helpful if I have not covered it today or in uh, some upcoming sessions. Thank you very much. <clears throat> so written consent for participants in survey, semantic data and GDPR, that's interesting. Anonymization, my colleague Maureen uh, is uh, running a workshop on anonymization and you can have a look at um, our events page uh, to register for that workshop. Then ethics and secondary data, that, that's interesting. Reusing data for student projects, that's good. Effect of AI. I'm also interested in AI these days, and I myself uh, attending. I'm attend looking for some workshops around this because that's, I think, the most um, interesting topic these days. International data transfers. Yeah, that's an important one. Thank you for adding it here. I'll keep that in mind for our future sessions. Data retention time. Yeah, I think data retention time, um, this depends on the uh, particular specific organization or universities. They, they, every, every organization has their own data retention policies. So that's a difficult one. But as a general rule, ICO Information Commissioner Office, they, they say that do not retain data. If you if it is not required, do not collect data, personal data if it is not required. <clears throat> so ethical approvals, international sharing, retrospective data, archiving clinical, lots and lots of ideas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your ideas and I will try to incorporate these into our future workshops. So coming back to the workshop, the overall aim of this session is to show you the key considerations in primary and secondary data sharing. Um, the first section focuses on the key principles of ethical research. Um, which is then followed by the next section on legal frameworks that govern research data. And I'll also be covering the role of consent in research when it comes to data sharing, but very briefly, because I think on 5th of November, I do have uh, an in-depth workshop on consent issues in data sharing. Uh, and you can find the link on our uh, event page. And I will also talk you through to the key considerations in secondary data use, but again, very briefly, because there are two upcoming workshops on copyright issues um, in publishing as well as in secondary data use. I think uh, the next one is on publishing and is on 24th of October and the next um, and another one is on 29th. So you can register for these two in-depth ones. And I'll take your questions at the end. Um, I'm sure you all are aware uh, with the types of data, but just for those who are not, uh, research data is of two types, primary data and secondary data. And um, 
Primary data is the data that is collected by a researcher directly from the original source through experiments, surveys, interviews, observations, focus groups, and so on. Um, while the secondary data is an existing data gathered from studies, surveys, experiments that have been run by other people, um, uh, such as existing data sets at archives, essays, reviews, or any information available on social media. So in the first section, which is related to primary data, I'll briefly discuss the key principles of uh, research ethics. And as I mentioned earlier, I'll talk you through um, some of the ethical considerations and best practices in data sharing, including research, ethics, self-assessment tool um, by UKSA and uh, another framework by UK government. But uh, before I go to that, yeah, there is another quick question. So just a quick question. I'm sure uh, everyone is knowledgeable and you are aware of that. What do you think are your ethical obligations as a researcher, especially when it comes to data sharing? To protect identity, that's right. Anonymizing, protecting participants, keeping promises made, yes. Consent, ensure there is no identifiable data. If you have promised the participants um, anonymity, and then yes. Confidentiality, exactly. Accuracy, asking for consent for sharing. Yes, that's, that's really important when it comes to um, sharing data for future reuse. Following legal requirements of DP, etc. Yes, although it is ethical, but um, yeah, ethical principles are usually codified into law. So yes, that's, that's right. Anonymizing data, yes, to follow university's guidance. Yes, every organization has their own ethical review processes that you need to abide by. That's right. <clears throat> data privacy, yes. To promote scientific and social benefits, exactly. Anonymity. Yes, that's important when uh, your research span across different countries, then you need to check the specific country data protection laws. That's that's really important, great. Consider risk of misuse and mitigate those risks. Yes, that's right, distress, yes, because participants, they do have uh, certain rights, so you need to consider it's not uh, stressful for them, that that is true. I have read all your comments, all, all the responses, uh, even I have not verbally gone through them. That's that's great. Thank you very much uh, for engaging in it. So as uh, all of you have mentioned, uh, I, I'm sure if all of you have mentioned all of these uh, <clears throat> in your responses. So ethics issues are, most likely to arise around privacy, equality, diversity, health and safety, as you have mentioned. And um, research ethics um, govern the standards of conduct for scientific researchers. And um, it is also important to adhere to ethical principles in order to protect the dignity, rights and welfare of research participants, as some of you have mentioned. And researchers should also ensure that their research is beneficial to participants, um, science and society as well, and be realistic about the benefits that it is likely to deliver. And uh, research should be designed and conducted in a way that respects the rights, values, and autonomy of the participants as well. So, Researchers should also inform participants that they have a right to refuse to participate free of consequences and they can withdraw from the research without telling any reason. And um, in 
in the context of integrity, they, they, there is a clear fit between what researchers say they will do and how they will conduct their research. And um, transparency means being clear about the nature of the research and communicating this to those uh, involved. And researchers must exercise self-critical responsibility in the planning and conduct of their research. And um, uh, you, you are aware that research ethics committees and research organizations have a responsibility to guide and support researchers, um, especially when the research involves difficult ethical decisions. So uh, researchers should maintain the independence of their research and uh, where conflicts of interest cannot be avoided, they should be made explicit. That's very important. And... Um, Independence of research should be founded on academic credentials, professional standards, expertise and experience, and it should always be free from personal, organizational, political bias and um, considerations of gain should be um, safeguarded at all times. And last but not the least, it is extremely important that participants are fully informed about the collection, use, and archiving of their data and uh, informing them about the future use should be different to the consent, different to obtaining consent uh, um, for the participation in research. So that, that is really important when it comes to data sharing. <clears throat> so, um, it is important that researchers do not just consider what can be done with the data, uh, methods, expertise, and technology available to them. It is equally important that researchers consider what should be done. Um, National Statisticians Data Ethics Advisory Committee provide a framework to help all researchers to think about the ethics of their research at an early stage and give them confidence that their plans address ethical principles and practices. I have added a link to, they have also got a tool as well, uh, which is called UKSA Ethics Self-Assessment Tool. So here's a link on the slide. Uh, they have, the tool is very useful. Um, to review the ethics of the project to be undertaken. And this tool enables to identify and mitigate any ethical issues. And it is based on six main principles, as you can see, um, public good confidentiality, methods and quality, legal compliance, and public view and engagement and transparency. And you are asked to assess your project against 22 items. Um, grouped against these six ethical principles on a scale. Um, it is beyond the scope of this session to go into further details of this tool, but please go and have a look uh, if you're interested. There is a link, as I said on the previous slide for you. Then there is another useful resource called Data Ethics Framework by the UK government. Uh, this framework provides guidance on the appropriate and responsible data use in government and the wider public se sector. Um, it also helps to understand ethical considerations, um, address these within the, within the projects. And I'll show you a guide available on the website. And I have added a link as well. So this is the guidance. This is the guide from UK government uh, around data ethics framework. And you can see that there is the basic information. What is it for? Who is it for? How to use it and the structure. And the framework consists of um, uh, three overarching principles and specific actions that covers the entire pro process of a project. And each section includes questions that will guide you through ethical considerations for your project. And you can also go through the description and specific questions to make sure you are adhering to the ethics. So I found it very useful. So here's a scoring for transparency from zero to five and what zero means, what five means, and then 
scoring for the accountability and fairness and then self-assessment table for the three principles, the score you got then for the five specific actions. So that I, I found it very, very useful. So, yeah. So you can see that that's quite, quite, quite comprehensive guide. But as I said, it's, it's beyond the scope to go into details. You, you can have a look at it later on. So some of the best practices um, are that ethical obligations should be considered throughout the research life cycle from planning and research design stage, data collection stage up to the future uses included, including publications, archiving, sharing and linking of data. Everything needs to be considered from the very onset of the research project. And it is also essential to have a knowledge about the standards and requirements of the relevant research organizations and um, always comply with the relevant laws, avoid social and personal harm. And you can always check with the data centers or data archives as they facilitate eth ethical and legal reuse of research data and um, always uh, advise you on protection of participants and safeguarding personal data and um, uh, most importantly, consent should be in place for the future uses of data. And as, as I said, this should be different to re participating in research or as a lawful basis. So this section is all about, um, the, the next one is about legal frameworks that go on research data. So in the context of data sharing, it would be easier to talk you through about the legal frameworks that govern research data if I take a broader classification of research data by health research authority. So it will help you understanding it. So according to health research authority, data or information is broadly classified into three main categories. Um, information that relates to identified or identifiable individual, information that no longer relates to identified or identifiable individual, um, which some refer to as anonymous data, and synthetic data. And I'll go through each of these briefly and the legal frameworks governing these. Uh, so the first uh, type is information that relates to identified or identifiable individuals. But before that, just a quick um, intro to the personal information or data. Uh, I'm sure you are aware of it, uh, but um, just as a refresher, you, you can identify an individual through personal information about that person. And uh, people can be identified directly or indirectly. Direct identifiers are name, address, postcode, telephone number, voice, picture, and ident uh, indirect identifiers are occupation, geography, unique or exceptional values, which when combined can identify a person. Um, personal data also includes special category data that needs more protection because uh, it is sensitive. And uh, it also, uh, yeah, the UK GDPR defines special category data as personal data revealing racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, um, religious or philosophical beliefs, and uh, genetic data, biometric data, uh, or any uh, data concerning health. So most health research uses special categories of personal data. So Basically, if personal information about people is collected or used in research, data protection regulation applies. So that's the basic rule. There are two main legal frameworks governing the use of health and care information or any, any sort of personal information that relates to the identified or identifiable individuals, the common law or duty of confidentiality and data protection regulation. We'll go through each of these. 
So in the UK, there is a duty of confidentiality that is based in common law and that occurs where confidential information comes to the knowledge um, of a person in circumstances where it would be unfair if it were then to be disclosed to others. And um, th there are some exceptions when you can disclose information, for example, if participants consent to onward sharing of their personal data, then sharing does not breach confidentiality. And sometimes public interest can override uh, duty of confidentiality and occasionally there are instances when you may need to give up um, data such as on a court order. So um, it's always advisable that uh, you need to avoid any specific promises and consent forms. So that's the best practice. Uh, <clears throat> as researchers, we must adhere to data protection requirements when managing or sharing personal data. So if personal information about people is collected or used in research, then the data protection regulation applies. And uh, the most uh, widely applicable uh, regulations um, to the research are Data Protection Act and the UK GDPR. Um, also, uh, I would also mention EU GDPR here, which is the Europe Union wide data protection regulation that, that was introduced in 2018 and replaced UK Data Protection Act that was used until that time. However, since the UK left EU, it is now called the EU, uh, it is now called the UK GDPR. So it is important for researchers to ensure that they gain local support from their um, data protection officer when their research project will span across the EU. So now if the researcher based in the UK collects personal data about people anywhere in the world or a researcher outside the UK collect personal data on UK citizens, then DPA and UK GDPR uh, both applies. However, if the researchers are undertaking research projects that span across the EU, then the EU GDPR also applies. Uh, UK GDPR specifies the rights a data subject has when their personal data are processed. So for example, participants have the right to be informed about the collection and use of their personal data. They also have a right to access the information you hold and they can request any change in the information. They can ask for erasure they can object or ask to restrict processing. And they can also object in terms of data portability or transfers and any sort of decision making. So which of these rights will be relevant to processing personal data for your research project will depend on the nature of the project, um, the selected processing ground and in which country the research is taking place. So these, these are some of the considerations. Um, everyone responsible for using personal data has to follow strict rules called data protection principles. They must make sure that the information is used fairly, lawfully and transparently and uh, processing should be justified under the lawful basis. Uh, for example, when public task is used, ensure that a task should be in the public interest. I'll go through these uh, lawful basis in a minute. So uh, you also need to consider that processing should not have adverse effects on the data subjects. You should be transparent with the participants by providing them with clear, concise, and comprehensive information and uh, providing um, information about the purposes of processing any changes or updates in the research scope, method methodology, or data usage. And in addition, personal data should be collected specifically for the intended purposes of the research. It should always be used for specific, specified explicit purposes and um, it should be used in a way that is adequate, relevant, and limited to only what is necessary. So 
Yeah, and information should always be accurate and where necessary kept up to the date and not kept longer than is necessary. So these are some of the principles. Um, and yeah, the confidentiality and integrity is uh, also important. So these are some of the principles that you need to abide by if you are processing personal data. So under the UK GDPR, there are six possible grounds for processing personal data and one of these must be present. First one is the consent, uh, where the individual has given clear consent for you to process their personal data for a specific purpose. And then public task, uh, it can also be used as a lawful basis when the processing is necessary for you to perform a task in the public interest. For example, a longitudinal study of people living with dementia and their carers to identify how people would like to be supported and findings from this study can inform and support the caring strategy and public advocacy. So this is considered as in the public interest. The, the next one is the legitimate interest when the processing is necessary for your legitimate interest or the legitimate interest of a third party, unless there is a good reason to protect the individual's personal data, uh, which overrides those legitimate interests. For example, a research project funded and undertaken by a private corporation to look at the effects of smoking on car passengers. So then there is another condition to process personal data, which is vital interest. And this could be used when the processing is necessary to protect someone's life. Uh, for example, hospital treating a patient after a serious road accident can search for um, the person's ID to find previous medical history or to contact his uh, next of kin. Then legal obligation as a lawful basis is when the processing is necessary for you to comply with the law, uh, such as processing personal data as part of a health and safety report or any incident. And the contract could be used when the processing is necessary for a contract you have with the individual or because they have asked you to take a specific step before entering into a contract. An example could be an employment contract. So as I said, um, in order to process personal data, one of these must be present. So just a quick question on Menti which will also give you a break well, from listening to an intense and dry content. Just a general question based on your experience or information, which legal basis have you used or intend to use for your research project? So in font consent, public task, DPA, public interest. Children Act, that's interesting. GDPR, MNCA, that's, I have never heard of MNCA. That, that would be interesting. Contractual understanding. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, there, there are some uh, abbreviations that I am not familiar of, so that would be interesting to look at later. Thank you very much for engaging yeah, so coming back to this um, Information Commissioner's Office, uh, ICO, advises that for almost all research conducted in the UK organizations should rely on either public task for all, all public bodies, such as uh, health service, universities, uh, UKRI, and so on, or 
legitimate interest for non-public bodies, which could be charities, commercial companies, and so on. However, those holding and using health information, which is a special category or personal data, uh, will also require a further condition in addition to the uh, lawful base, uh, such as public tax. So you need one more condition if you are handling uh, special category data. And in academia, this, this additional condition is usually to support uh, scientific and historical research. And in addition, you also need to complete a data protection impact assessment for any type of processing which is likely to be high risk. So you must therefore be aware of the risks of processing the special category data. So it all depends on the project and the context you are using, but mainly, generally speaking, uh, it's uh, public interest uh, for all the public bodies and legitimate interest for non-public bodies. And if you are processing special category data, then there is an additional condition to be used. So there, there is a misconception that data protection law such as the GDPR prohibits data sharing. Um, however, it does not prevent data sharing as long as you approach it in a sensible and proportionate way. Uh, it is useful for research because it legalizes much of the current good uh, practices in research, placing people at the center, and it offers enhanced rights to individuals whose data is being processed. And um, in the context of research, G uh, UK GDPR has the potential to further benefit research and archiving and um, helping to improve trust and confidence between the public and their organizations and uh, between researchers and their participants as well. And it also allows uh, uh, to uh, re uh, allows the research with con uh, specific safeguards. I'll come to that in a minute. So this was uh, all about the uh, data that can be identified or identifiable. And if you remember, there is a second uh, type of the data I mentioned uh, on that list, um, the broader classification from HRA, uh, that um, there is a second type that no longer relates to identified or identifiable individuals. And this is the data that has been anonymized or pseudonymized. So Personal data that has undergone effective anonymization is not, however, regarded as personal data um, under the UK GDPR. It is, it is not subject to the data protection regulations. So this is because the data has been modified and is no longer relates to an identified or identifiable individual. There, there are several anonymization techniques that can be used. Um, such as aggregating, suppression, rounding, reduction in detail, addition of noise, and so on. But um, uh, I am unable to go into the details. And as I mentioned, you can register for our anonymization workshop that my colleague will be running, I think, in the upcoming days. So it is also important to note that even when data is anonymized, it may still be possible to find ways of identifying the individual uh, individual's personal information. However, it would um, likely require specific circumstances or efforts. And this effort may involve using other sources of information to narrow down the number of individuals that the data may be re referring to. So it all depends on the context and the resources available. But overall, as a general rule, anonymized data um, is not um, subject to the UK GDPR. On the other hand, pseudonymization is a security enhancing process that replaces or removes information in a data that um, directly identifies an individual and it is um, typically applied before information is shared with a third party uh, if you are to share the data. Uh, for example, it could um, inv involve replacing an NHS number, a name or an address with a unique number or code. Um, 
which is called pseudonym with the effect that identifying an individual direct from the data is not possible by the recipient without additional information. Uh, that additional information is the key that would enable matching the pseudonym to direct identifiers in the data and um, or any means to re-identify the data. So the personal data that has undergone pseudonymization but could still be attributed to an identifiable individual by the use of the data alone or in combination with other data likely to be available is legally presumed to remain personal data under the UK GDPR. So that's, that's the basic rule. The third type I mentioned on that slide uh, is uh, the synthetic data, which is any data that is artificially created um, rather than generated by real world events. Um, it can simulate synthetic populations that resemble the characteristics as well as diversity of actual people. And it can also be generated to be statistically consistent with a real data set, which it may then replace or augment as um, synthetic data is neither personal data nor confidential personal information. It is not subject to data protection legislation or the common law of uh, confidentiality. This is the general uh, thoughts around synthetic data. There is another debate because uh, it is uh, a new field. So it may ranges from low fidelity to high fidelity synthetic data. And there is a debate that um, high fidelity synthetic data could be disclosive. So, but um, it is, um, beyond the scope of um, this workshop to go into such details. We, we are having a workshop this coming Monday on synthetic data. If any one of you is interested in that, please go and register for that uh, on our events page. <clears throat> so this section focuses on the role of consent in research. So I'm sure you all are familiar with what informed consent is. However, when it comes to data sharing, then consent is used for two purposes, to fulfill ethical obligation and to be legally compliant. So we, we are all familiar that consent, um, which is used for research participation and is considered as one of the founding principles of research ethics, uh, where it is sought before participation in any research activity and for all participants. And usually it involves providing information regarding study purposes, risks, benefits, voluntary participation, and um, um, so on. However, as uh, stated earlier, consent can be used as one of the legal basis or lawful basis of processing personal data under the UK GDPR. Um, and uh, if a researcher collects, manages and share personal data, then consent of the data subject can be used as a lawful base to process um, their personal information. But as mentioned earlier, in the UK it is uh, usually not used uh, and public task was used instead of the consent. But uh, it is not mandatory under the UK GDPR, but you need to obtain an explicit consent under common law or duty of confidentiality when you have to disclose or share confidential information for research purposes or if you are working on a health health related data, then uh, you need to obtain an explicit consent as an additional condition. So, yeah. Uh, consent can be gained in written or oral form and the format depends on the kind of research. Uh, it is important that whatever format is used, it should be documented. You need to document how it has been gained, what information has been provided to the participants and what they have agreed to. So consent uh, forms 
play a vital role in data sharing and it is very important that you design the consent form keeping in mind these three important sections um, if you if your plan is to uh, share your data for future reuse then um, the first section should be about taking part in the study that includes some basics such as participants have read and understood information about the project they have been given the opportunity to ask questions. They understand that they can withdraw at any time. And uh, the second section is uh, about how the information that is being collected will be used. For example, how the data will be stored for how long, how the confidentiality will be maintained. Um, and the final section should be around providing information about future uses of the data, such as publications, archiving, and so on. The final section in the consent form is really important if you are to share the data for future reuse by other researchers. I'll go through the, the example consent forms that um, consent statements in the, in, in the workshop I'm running on consent issues on, I think it's on 5th of November. So I'll show you the consent form template we, we propose to use and um, some real consent form examples in that workshop. So when you start a research project that involves collecting information from people, for example, through a survey or interview or focus group or video recording, then these questions can help you to comply with the data protection legislation in practice. The first consideration should be whether the project needs to collect information that would be defined as personal data. If not, then do not collect it. If the research does not collect personal data, then data protection legislations will not apply. If uh, Personal data being collected, the researcher needs to identify who will be the data controller for the collection, storage and handling of the data. This is unlikely to be the researcher themselves and in most instances will be the researchers, universities or institutes. And um, if the research involves collaborations of different partners, it, it will be important to identify whether there will be um, joint controllers of the data, data or data processors, it will be crucial to ensure data sharing agreements should be in place and where necessary, a processor and controller agreement as well. Uh, just for your information, data controller is the person who determine the purposes of uh, uh, for which and the way in which personal data is processed. By contrast, a data processor is anyone who processes personal data on behalf of the data controller. For example, if you deposit data with us, you are the controller and we are the processor. Um, and an, an assessment will also be needed to uh, be, I think, made about the most appropriate processing ground to use for each research project. If you are using consent as the processing ground, uh, it is crucial that this is distinguished from consent for other ethical and legal purposes and that participants can withdraw their consent for processing personal data. And as I said, this should be dif different uh, from the research participation. If public task is used as the processing ground, then you must ensure that your university or institute is classified as a public authority and that the research will be in the public interest. If you are using legitimate interest as a processing ground, then a legitimate interest assessment should be undertaken. This will need um, to identify the legitimate interest being pursued. So, yeah, so all these uh, questions can help you uh, in handling personal data. And um, the information that needs communicating will be influenced by which processing ground is chosen. So broadly, participants should be informed about how any personal data collected about them will be used, stored, processed, transferred, and uh, who the data controller is. Uh, the legal grounds and purposes of processing any 
um, recipients of the personal data and the period of retention and their rights and so on. So just remember that despite all the information I have give, gone through, um, much research data, even sensitive data, can be shared ethically and legally if researchers employ certain strategies. For example, offering protection of identities through anonymization or de-identification, de using processing ground for personal data, regulating access where needed, and uh, so on. I'll go through this regulating regulated access in a minute. So these, these three strategies can help you in sharing personal data. So by regulating access, uh, it facilitates data sharing, especially when it is not possible to anonymize data or to obtain consent for data sharing. In that case, you can restrict user access. For example, here at uh, UK Data Service, we facilitate three levels of access for data. Open access for data that contains no personal information, safeguarded access for data that contain no personal information, but the data owner considers a risk of disclosure resulting from linkage to other data. And it is available under end user license and users need to register to access data. Users also need to agree to certain conditions such as not to disclose any identifying information. And uh, the controlled access is for data that may be disclosive. Controlled data are only available to users who have been trained and accredited and their data usage has been approved by the relevant data access committee and access is through a virtual or physical secure environment and uh, access varies uh, according to user type location, data access conditions, and project type. So the, these are uh, some of uh, the access conditions where you can manage and regulate access to the, the data. So you can see the uh, Mentimeter code on top of this slide. So it's just a quiz. Uh, what do you think? Uh, effectively, anonymous data is not subject to the UK GDPR. Is it true or false? Yeah, as, as a general, I think, principle under the UK GDPR, if the data is effectively anonymized and there is no risk of disclosure, then it is not subject to the UK GDPR. That's right, thank you. And what do you think about this? If the researcher based in the UK collects data from the EU, which of the following applies? Exactly, both EU, GDPR and the UK GDPR, although they both are aligned at the moment, but um, if the researcher is based in the UK, then the UK GDPR applies. And if, he's, uh, if they are collecting data from the EU, then both UK and EU GDPR, both, both of these may apply. And what do you think here? Informing participants about the future uses of data is an ethical obligation, a legal obligation, or it depends? I think for this one, there isn't any right or wrong answer. It could be a legal obligation. It, it definitely is an ethical obligation. Ethically, you should um, inform them. And it also depends if what processing ground you're using. Maybe you're already using consent uh, to process the personal data. Anyway, um, it it is an ethical obligation and it could also depends. Although I have not covered the consent forms in detail, but 
I thought that this this is important, so I have added it here. I will be covering this in my consent workshop. But uh, what do you think? Any information uh, we we do come across very often uh, to such statements when the data has been deposited with us. The consent forms that has been used they they have such statements. Any information I give will be used for research only and will not be used for any other purpose. Is this appropriate? Yes, there is a comment that consent form needs to be specific. That's that's right. Depends exactly. It also depends. But just keep in mind, if you are to share the uh, share the data for future reuse, then such statements uh, precludes data sharing. If you are not to share your data for future reuse, then uh, then that that should be fine. That would be an assurance to the participants. So yeah, it it's it is too vague exactly. So if if you plan to share data, then do avoid such statements, or make it very specific that this statement is about personal data. You are about to give them assurance that their personal data is safe. It will not be accessed by anyone else other than the researchers. And yeah, so this sort of statements does preclude sometimes data sharing. They are vague, so you need to be very specific. Yeah, so exactly, it is, it is definitely vague. So there is another statement that we can come across every now and then when any data is deposited with us. So I understand that only the research team will have access to the data I will provide. Again, if you think, keeping in mind that this data is being deposited for future use, then this is a problematic statement. It, it does preclude data sharing. So yes, it could be more specific. Yeah, exactly. So you see that um, when as researchers, when I, I have done my PhD, I never considered such statements. I just use my de departmental consent form and I never thought about how uh, important such statements are. Yeah, you need to specify which data you are referring. Is it personal data? Is it all the raw data, which data you are referring to. So that's right. So these, these things need to be considered, especially if you plan to share your data for future reuse, and especially these days when you uh, are asked by the funders or the journals, they, they, are, they have started asking for data as well when you uh, want to publish with them. So these statements are very, very important. and this as well. So it, it relates to the data retention policy. And as I said uh, in the beginning, that uh, retention policies are organization specific. So, but if you plan to share data or you are required by your funder or journal uh, to share the data, then this is a problematic statement. You you have to destroy the data. And again, here you need to be very specific which data you are referring to. Is it raw data? Is it personal data? Which data? And you should not make such promises in your consent forms. Yes, you need to focus on your storage platforms. That's That's right. Yeah, so thank you very much. That was it for now. Thank you for your responses. So this section is about, this is the last one uh, about what needs to be considered if you are planning to use secondary data sources. Most important issues are the rights inherent in secondary data. 
two most relevant types of rights applicable to the secondary data sources are copyright and database right and i will talk you through to copyright uh, which is most important due to time constraints and have added a link at the bottom for other rights for you to have a look at if you're interested. So copyright or IP rights are assigned automatically to the creator or the researcher who owns the data. When data are shared or archived, the original owner retains the right and data archive cannot ar archive data unless all right holders are identified and give permission for their data to be shared. So copyright applies as soon as the data is created. You are the copyright owner of the data that you share for future use by other researchers uh, in the context of primary data. If you plan to share it for future reuse, you need to consider how you want your data to be reused by other researchers or um, students. You, you can specify this by licensing the data to match the intended uses. And um, various types of licenses for sharing data have been developed by the data archives. So, um, in the UK, copyright arises automatically once a work is created and to enjoy copyright protection, the work must be original. That is to say, it must be your own work, not copied from someone else. And um, there is no copyright in ideas or facts, only in the way those ideas are expressed, such as diagrams or tables. So. As researchers, when you need to obtain copyright clearance, yeah, uh, please, uh, you need to bear in mind that you do not need copyright clearance if you incorporate the factual data in your own words in a structure owned by yourself. You may not need to obtain permission if you are making a copy and utilizing that copy for your own research, as long as it is not made available to others or citing from the research data. But you do need copyright clearance if you are going to include the secondary data in a publication or plan to share that data with other people. So it also applies to incorporating secondary data in your own database that you intend to share with others. So that 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 is important. You you can use secondary data for your own use, but when it comes to depositing that data uh, with any repository or with any journal, then you do need to check the permissions or licenses or terms and con conditions associated with that. I'll go through these um, in my copyright and secondary data use workshop in detail. So here I have added a scenario for you. Uh, you can read it and then we'll go to the Mentimeter for the responses. <clears throat> just for some of your thoughts on this. So here is the first question. What do you think based on your general information? Any thoughts on that? So here, a researcher studies how health issues around obesity are reported in the media in the last 10 years. They have used freely available newspapers, websites, library sources um, to obtain articles on the topic. So what do you think? Can they use public data without breaching copyright? Yes, they can, because it is for their personal use. That's, that is absolutely right. Data is freely available for the public use, yes, as long as it falls under fair use, yes.
So here the question focuses on can a researcher use? So yes, he can, uh, they, the researcher can use public data without breaching copyright. So the next question is a bit tricky. So now can they, this data be archived and shared with other researchers for future use, whatever they have collected, the newspaper articles or whatever form it is in? No. It depends how it has been licensed. Is it under copyright? That's right. This would require getting permission. Yeah, depends on the license use exactly. Yes, that, that is absolutely right. Even though the articles obtained are in the public domain, they are still under copyright. While such information can be used for personal research purposes, um, such as fair dealing, the articles cannot be archived unless permission is obtained from the newspapers. Otherwise, this would breach copyright. So you need to check the terms and conditions associated if it is um, allowed. Sometimes they have uh, terms and conditions uh, under, I think, very at the very bottom of the web page, uh, you can click on terms and conditions and then you can see what you're allowed to do with the information available on that website and what you're not allowed to do. And most of the time they do mention that you are, uh, whether you are allowed to share it or whether you are not allowed to share it. Usually it is for your personal use, but not, uh, you need to obtain permission. So it depends. You need to check the terms and conditions and then uh, you uh, can decide what to do depending on the terms and conditions. So, yep, thank you very much. So if you are using secondary sources, then best practice is to assess who the copyright holder of the data set is. Are you allowed to use them and in what way? Are you allowed to archive and publish them in a data repository? And uh, most of the time we encounter problems when researchers are allowed to use data uh, uh, for their personal use, but um, they do not realize that they do need permission uh, from the original data source. So, yes, if the permission is not granted, then they need to take that copyright uh, material uh, off uh, from the collection. So to be legally compliant, always investigate early which laws apply to your data, including cross-country collaborative working. Do not collect or keep personal or sensitive data if not essential to your research. Plan early on, seek advice from your research office and ensure that you check participants, know how this data will be used and remember not all research data is personal. For example, anonymous, anonymized data is not personal data. And here are some of the resources I have added here on this slide that that could be helpful. And these are two links. Uh, if you want to register for our upcoming training events on this slide. Yeah, and that's it. Thank you very much. You are also welcome to email me if you have any project related questions, any other questions that I've missed uh, in the chat. Thank you very much for attending today's session.